Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from the Wichita Mountains of Oklahoma. Today is Tuesday, June 7th, 2022. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, please forgive me, guys. It's currently like 10.30 at night. My days tend to be quite long <sighs> remodeling this cafe. I, I think things are about to get quicker because we've <laughs> been given the opportunity to bring in some more people to help us because currently it's pretty much just me and my wife doing it. And it takes a little while when you have so many things to do, but we're getting there. We're looking at probably five weeks to be open, hopefully. We'll see. Anyway, let's have a look at a few things that really matter. It seems Iran is so much in the news these days, and I, I keep bringing it up and mentioning it because they are a very prominent player in end-time ministries. Persia, which is modern-day Iran, leads a world army against Israel. Ezekiel 38 and 39 tell us all about it. We're watching so many things line up that show us that this could happen very soon. Very soon. Um, I know I've been reporting on things like this for some 10, 12 years. But, you know, the Bible says a thousand years with the Lord is like a day, so it's coming in his timing. Out of World Israel News, Israeli jets strike Damascus. Syria confronts hostile missiles, according to a report. Damascus in Syria. Remember Paul, who was Saul at the time, was on the road to Damascus when this bright light shown all around, it was Christ appearing to him, saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he was blinded for three days, and his name was changed to the Apostle Paul. And he has told more people about Christ than probably anyone on the planet. Wrote half the New Testament, pretty much. Damascus will be destroyed. Isaiah 17, 1 prophesies this. We're seeing steps that seem to indicate it could happen any day now. I'm kind of thinking it'll probably be Israel that causes this prophecy to come to pass because Iran will attempt to build some kind of stronghold there and fortify themselves there and Israel will say, no, you don't, and they'll wipe them out and they'll strike Damascus so hard that it ceases to exist as a city, like Isaiah 17.1 tells us. So many things we're watching today that the Bible prophesies about, it's... To me, it's to me it's exciting because the sooner we see these things happen, the sooner we see Christ return, and the sooner we go home. Out of the Times of Israel headline says, "Frustrated West beginning to turn up heat on Iran." West is getting tired of what Iran is doing. The International Atomic Energy Agency board is set to censure Tehran for all kinds of issues going on. Iran's nuclear program, they're breaking all the rules. I mean, the world is looking to put political pressure, diplomatic pressure on Iran. And, you know, I hate to say it, but it might be too late. Might be too late. I think, I think we're going to see Israel strike Iran. And then Iran responds with exactly what Ezekiel 38 and 39 tell us. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Iran crossing nuke enrichment, uh, Iran crossing nuke uranium enrichment threshold cannot be avoided, the IAEA says. Cannot be avoided. Iran failed to reduce concerns about its violations of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Safeguards Agreement. It will eventually cross the uranium enrichment threshold. Yet, no one seems to be doing anything about it. Which just kind of boggles the mind to me. It's like, oh yeah, let's just let them get away with this. In other news, out of the Daily Wire, headline says, Al-Qaeda now has a safe haven in Afghanistan under the Taliban operating with freedom of action, according to a UN report. Just another instance where we can say, thanks, Joe, you did that. <coughs> because his horrible pull out of Afghanistan, which was a disaster, 
resulted in the deaths of military of numerous U.S. military personnel, gave thousands upon thousands of weapons to the enemy. You know what? I have a hard time somebody preaching gun control to me when he gave some 400,000 guns to the enemy, to known terrorist groups. I'm sorry, Joe. You're not qualified to preach to me about gun control when you're so reckless and moronic with your decision to leave hundreds of thousands of guns in the hands of our known enemies. Bye bye Just saying. Um, <clears throat> once again, D-Day came and went without a mention from the president or from Joe Biden. <sighs> Last year, Joe Biden failed to mention D-Day. You know, D-Day. It was the early morning of June 7th in Normandy, France, honoring those who gave their lives on those beaches of Normandy that we might have freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to bear arms, and all these other freedoms that these left-wing losers are so desperately trying to take away from us. <clears throat> Out of Fox News, headline says, Biden blasted for continuing to shift blame, refusing to take responsibility for crisis. Let's see, gas has more than tripled. Joe, day one, closing down Keystone Pipeline. What do you think would happen? You know, Joe closed, closes down a baby formula production plant, and suddenly we have no baby formula. Joe, what do you think would happen? You know, you really can't mess up this badly unless you're trying to do it on purpose. And I can't help but think that these left-wing losers, the elitists, they're, they're so pushing for the one world government. They're willing to throw America under the bus for it. That's why they were so seethingly mad with Trump promoting America. Oh, that nationalism's going to get in the way of the one world government. I mean, granted, the one world government is coming. There's nothing we can do to stop it. But it is not a problem for us to be looking to support America before supporting the world. Here we have a food crisis, a shortage. We have famines. We have highest gas prices in our history. Yet we can send $40 billion to Ukraine. Huh. How much baby formula, formula would that buy? Just curious. How much food would that provide for starving people here at home? Here's something for you out of the New York Post. Elon Musk asks why the Department of Justice hasn't leaked Jeffrey Epstein's client list. Hey, lots of pedophiles on that list. How come we don't know about them? How come those names aren't plastered all over the media? Well, because there's a lot of media people that are on that list, isn't there? A lot of famous people, a lot of high political positions of power that are on that list, isn't there? Somehow it's okay when they break the law. Hmm. You know, until we start prosecuting these criminal politicians, we're not ever going to trust them. Let's start putting some in jail that break the law. How about, like, now? We need to continuously live in God's will. In Romans 8, verse 14, Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They're the sons of God. There's something we need to know about living in the will of God. I mean, let's, let's talk about it. Let's look at that. It's, it's this principle of submitting. I know for a lot of people, that's like fingernails on a chalkboard. It's like, eh, submit. Wait, no, I don't want to submit. Surrender. <laughs> Giving it all to God. We should be so overwhelmed and completely moved by all that God has done for us. I mean, starting with Christ on the cross, the resurrection. We should be so overwhelmed that we're willing to surrender our lives to Him every day every single day in service. We should say to the Lord, here am I, use me. 
Do whatever you need to do with me, Lord. May your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. Whatever it is. I can remember in my early 20s feeling the call of God on my life to preach. And I felt totally unqualified. I said, Lord, who am I to tell others about Christ? Look look how I'm living. I'm living in sin. It was the 80s. You know, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll decade. And I was fully absorbed in all of it. Um, I kind of did like Jonah, I turned and ran. I was like, I, I'm not qualified. Do you, who, look how I'm living. And I've heard people, preachers and, and counselors that I've gone to saying, you know, I, I, I feel like God wants to use me, but I, I just don't feel qualified. And I've, I've come to realize over the years that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. See, we try to put it in our own terms, and sadly, none of us are qualified with our own abilities. Um, I've heard someone, one preacher told me one time, said, Daryl, you might be the only Bible some people ever read. And that stuck with me. And I realized, yeah, there's a lot of people that watch what I do. They see how I respond in a crisis, in a time of trouble. And it's amazing. I, I've had... Uh, pastors or counselors say, you know what, Daryl? Live your life. Give God the glory. Live for Christ every day. You know, tell your friends about Christ. Tell your, your co-workers about Christ. So that when He does call you and shows you what He wants, then you'll be ready. And that's that's advice I can follow. We need to surrender completely saying, Lord, you have all of me. I want to do what you want me to do, not what I want to do. Like Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will be done, but your will be done, Lord. And then we need to follow God wherever he leads us and do whatever he asks of us. That's how you live in the will of God. That's how you do what we're here to do, surrendering to God. We, we need to let him mold us and make us and shape us in Isaiah 45, starting in verse 5, it says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. There's some people that don't know this verse. Yeah, God creates evil, he says. Drop down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it, he says. Woe unto him that strives with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashions it, What makest thou, or thy work? He hath no hands. There's all kinds of scriptures throughout the Bible that talk about God being the potter and us being the clay. You know, he's molding us and making us and shaping us more and more into the image of his son, Jesus. It's the creator's right to transform us and shape us his children's lives as he sees fit and he's conforming us to the image of his son Romans 8 29 he's he's helping us to not conform to the world or give in to our former lusts Romans 12 verse 2 and 1st Peter 1 14 he's shaping us the problem comes when we don't like this molding process you know then we argue with the potter we complain about the troubles the trials the difficulties the afflictions that sometimes results while he's shaping us. You know, Isaiah 45, 9 says, Will the clay say to the potter, Hey, what are you doing? You know, our part as the clay is to remain pliable and to submit to God's purposes. And not let parts of our life toughen up and resist his attempts to shape us and be like, Well, God, I've given you all these other parts of my life, but that part you need to stay out of. We need to surrender it all. Surrender all. 
God will work to remove those hard lumps so he can form us into the vessels that are useful and pleasing to him for his purposes, not for our purposes. We need to accept any changes that God shapes and makes into our lives. We know that his plan is best, his plan is perfect, and we can trust what he's going to mold us and make us and shape us into. The best place you can possibly be is in the potter's hands. So submit yourself to the Lord and let him make you into what he created you to be. Because we are his servants. And there is a thing called servant power. I mean, in Mark 4, 41, it says, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Even the wind and the sea obey Jesus. You know, when God created this physical world and everything in it, he gave mankind authority to rule over and subdue his creation. Even though God still owned everything in the universe and all that was in it, he gave control of the earth to man. It's quite a responsibility. But when man sinned, he started to use this power against God's wishes. You know, God didn't ordain all the terrible things that have happened throughout history, and, and yet he, he did not um, take back man's right to dominate the earth. Instead... God became a man and took back that authority by himself, to himself, by conquest. Yeah, after Jesus' resurrection in Matthew 20, 28, 18, he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he gave the great commission to his disciples, conferring that authority upon them also. I mean, Jesus becoming flesh, God becoming flesh was absolutely necessary for gaining all power or authority in heaven and earth. I mean, Jesus was God in human flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16, John 1, verse 1, and verse 14. So many places in Scripture. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus came in the power and authority of his Father to point men to the Father. I mean, Jesus existed long before the virgin birth on earth. In the beginning, God created them in his image. He said, let us make man in our image. Who's the us? Who's the plural? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. These three have always been, always will be. Christ was there in the beginning. He's been there from the beginning. Um, his, his appearance here on earth was in the form of God, and he was equal with God. Yet he humbled himself, and he became a servant while he was here on earth. He didn't promote himself. But he came to give himself as the only way to God the Father. John 14, 6, my favorite verse in all of Scripture. This is completely different from the way so-called great men presented themselves in history. The Roman Caesar of Jesus' day proclaimed that he was God and he demanded people to worship him. I've said it a thousand times. If there's anyone claiming to be God and saying, worship me, and you're still standing on your feet, you know that man's a liar because you cannot stand in the presence of the true God you will fall to your knees in his presence. Um, lesser leaders throughout history ruled by exalting themselves over the people they govern. But Jesus said that whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 26 through 28. So, we're here to serve. We're created to serve. What are you doing in that regard? It's time to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many as you can until the day you stand before him. And you're going to be just like him, John tells us in 1 John 3, verse 2. So until then, we have a lot of work to do. So share the gospel of Christ. Tell others about the only one who can save them. Because it won't be long. And we'll have to answer for what we've done here. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.